the anterior part of it is flat and this is the part that would be um, against your back like this and it's called your subscapular fossa right here and the subscapular fossa is an attachment point for a rotator cuff muscle called the subscapularis maybe you've heard of someone that's torn their rotator cuff well it's one of four important muscles that hold your humerus to your body so your humerus is going to fit right here in the glenoid cavity and the subscapularis muscle its tendon wraps around the head of the humerus and holds it against your body so if you rip it then um, you're going to have problems with your arm dislocating then if you turn it this way now this is the the back the posterior part so it would be facing backward here is the spine of the scapula and then you see there's a groove above it and a flat part below it the part above is called the supra scapularis fossa and so supra means above and this one also is a rotator cuff muscle and its tendon wraps around the head of the humerus this evidently is the rotator cuff muscle that is torn the most often and you can see it's a in a position where it's gonna have a lot of strain on it then below the spine is another attachment for a muscle it's called the infraspinatus fossa, fossa and or infraspinous fossa sorry and the infraspinatus muscle attaches there wraps around the head of the humerus so those are the three most um, obvious rotator cuff muscles that people can hurt um, if they aren't careful with how they lift okay so and then I already pointed out the glenoid cavity now if you notice as you look at the glenoid cavity there's an attachment that comes off the top of it called the coracoid process and it gets its name because it looks like a crow's beak or a crow's head really the whole thing that's the coracoid process and on an articulated skeleton you can see it poking out at you right here and right here you want to see that there you got your hand right on it right there yep that's the coracoid process and then another important marking on the scapula that you can see is this very highest one called the acromion and part of its name is it has acro in it and that means like the topmost part the top of it and you can see it is the highest peak in the scapula so that's the acromion and what's interesting about the acromion is it makes up the pectoral girdle by joining this is a left one joining with the clavicle right here so the acromion articulates with the acromial end of the clavicle and to me it is the funniest articulation in the body because it looks like they just meet kind of end to end and if you look on a skeleton you'll see that it's not like the way doesn't it look right here that the humerus would nicely fit into the glenoid cavity mm -hmm. you think oh yeah that's a joint I can understand that this to me has always been a very funny looking joint it's like they just touch end to end and sure enough people can damage that joint and kind of rip it apart or dislocate it a little bit so the clavicle meets up with the acromion and then do you see the angle it forms right here this is where your chest cavity would be right here so that's how i know this is a left scapula is because i point the glenoid cavity um toward yeah i point the glenoid cavity this way and the spine this way and i know that the humerus is going to fit right here right this would be your arm hanging down and so therefore it has to go on the left like this now if i tried to put it over here look how funny that is see how that doesn't work then your arm would be in the middle of your body and that's impossible so therefore this is a left scapula now the clavicle is a little trickier did i get all the markings on the scapula though so coracoid process acromion glenoid cavity spine of scapula supraspinous fossa infraspinous fossa subscapular fossa and i showed you left or right clavicle you first have to figure out which end is going to attach to the sternum and which end is going to attach to the scapula so the sternal end is boxed off squared off you can kind of see that whereas the end that attaches to the scapula is flat 
So that's the first thing. You know, this is the sternal end, this is the acromial end. Then you have to figure out, well, does it go like this? Or does it go like this? And how do I know? How do I know that it goes like this, which it is, it's a left. If you look here, see how your sternum is anterior to your humerus? So that it first curves out and then in. So you have a convex curve first. You see that convex curve coming out at me? And if I tried to make this a right clavicle, which it's not, it would be going in. Where's the humerus? Oh, sure. That's your upper arm bone. So the humerus articulates with the glenoid cavity, the head of it does. That joint between the humerus and the glenoid cavity is one of only two ball and socket joints in your whole body. They're the most movable joints you have. So one is right here, and it allows you to do all of this kind of motion with your arm. We have so much motion, range of motion with our upper um, pectoral limbs. And the other one is your hips. Now, this one is not quite as movable as your shoulder joint, but that's because it's more weight bearing and it has to be more stable. So it sacrifices a little bit of range of motion for greater stability so that you're not dislocating your hips. Okay, so that covers it for scapula and clavicle. And now I'll look at the coxal bone or a hip bone.